With that, <clears throat> let's turn to some examples of uh, fire history here in, in California itself. So as we mentioned before, a little bit of review here to start with, um, we have this distinction between the quote unquote fire, where most people are thinking of a structure fire or an urban fire, versus wildfires, right? So, so when the fire is burning here, that's a wildfire. When it gets into these houses here, that would, that would become more of a structure fire or an urban fire. Obviously, an urban fire can become a wildfire. Wildfire can be, they can cross over, but, but and, and recall that we discussed that the general philosophy, modern philosophy here is when, when this house catches on fire, our fire fighting resources go to try to put that out, right? Put water on it, stop it right there aggressively, da da da. Whereas when the, wa when the fire is over here, the idea is more typically, if it's very small, they'll try to put it out. But assuming it's not very small, um, the idea is containment. So let it burn up to a point. And that's what you're seeing right here. In this case, these houses have a cleared area um, of vegetation, a, wrap, a buffer between the wildland and the, and the urban setting. And so this is essentially, assuming it's not like just crazy raging wind blowing in here, in which case this house is screwed. But, but if it's just uh, you know, a more typical condition, this would act as a so-called fire break. And so, so different management generally with wildfire versus urban fires or structure fires. Um, also, as a, as a recap, um, fire is a self-sustaining, um, high temperature uh, biochemical reaction, an oxidation reaction. Um, and it's a natural process. It's a natural process, right? So um, what's going on now, uh, as with um, hurricanes and some other things, um, these have always happened. These are a part of the ecosystems where they occur. Uh, critters have adapted to this, have evolved with these types of stress. But what's going on is um, these impacts are changing in intensity and in frequency. And so um, wildfire is one example of that, a natural process that's getting uh, harder to predict and having um, a, a, a different impacts on us. One, because of climate change stuff going forward, but also because of our recent history the management that we've exerted over pretty much the last hundred years or so um, for us here in California is the big issue there. Um, we mentioned also that this idea of the fire triangle. To have fire, we need the fuel, the stuff that's being burnt, oxygen, the, the source of, of the reaction, and then heat, which is the mechanism to, to get that, to, to facilitate that chemical reaction. And so the general approach of firefighters when they're trying to stop a fire is to knock at least one of those legs out. And that will work for most, that'll work for all wildfires. That won't work for some of our human synthetic things that are caught catching fire sometimes because they might have their own source of <clears throat> oxygen and sometimes their own source of heat. But, but for the most part, for wildfires, that fire triangle works. We talked about the three phases, the pre-ignition, the stuff that's getting the, the potential fuel ready to burn or more likely to burn. There's the combustion or the actual uh, uh, spark, the, the lightning, the, the, the weed whacker that chips the rock that causes the spark, whatever it is, there's, there's some little initial combustion thing. And then it's going to burn for a while, and then at some point it's going to go out. It's either going to go out because we actively put it out or because it runs out of one of those three uh, things. <clears throat> and then we mentioned how this stuff spreads. Um, we have uh, subterranean or ground fires, um, which would be primarily where we have intense um, carbon um, fuel sources underneath. So that would be like a lot of root mass, like a big giant you know, tree root mass kind of thing. Or a place like um, uh, peat bogs in, in, in places like that in areas like the UK or, or in Washington State, places like that, Alaska. <clears throat> mostly what we're talking about here in California are mostly surface fires. This is where the grass catches fire, the, 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 the shrubs catch fire, that kind of stuff. And, and the fire is moving along the surface of the landscape. Um, we're, we're particularly worried in a forest condition of the so-called crown fires, and that's where the, the, a large part of the fire leaves the, leaves the ground and goes all the way up to the very top apex of the, of the forest canopy, of the tree canopy, and then is burning from the tip of this tree to the tip of that tree to the tip of that tree. That's a so-called crown fire. So those are the three major spreading types. 
And then <clears throat> with all these things, we have feedback loops. And so, so our management is going to play into what the fuel load is, which is then going to make it more likely to burn, which is then going to create other things. And so, so with all these, with many of our, not all, but with many of our disasters, we're going to see our management choices are, are key to how they play out. And so there's potential strong feedback loops. That's feedback loops to encourage the disaster to be more likely to happen. But with proper management, we could be taking steps to um, uh, the other way for a negative feedback loop to sort of make, encourage the disaster um, to be less likely to occur. Okay, does that make sense? That was all review. Okay, so uh, some new stuff now. So let's talk about um, some of the aspects of, of fire in, in, in our California context. Um, so there's various things. We're, we're, we're not going into all this, right, because, it's, because the purpose of our class is to talk about the big picture here. But just so you guys know, there's um, different categories of, of fuels. Um, and there's different things that influence our modeling of how wildfires uh, uh, progress. In general, we have canopy fuels or stuff that's up off the ground. Okay, so canopy could be really high, you know, a redwood canopy that, that, or, or oak woodland canopy, that, that counts. Um, uh, but also uh, stuff close to the ground, and in particular stuff that has already died, the vegetation that's already fallen off, a leaf or a dead stem, something like that, that's on the ground are, is litter, and so litter fuels are also particularly um, important. And all these things, that, so these are just a list I, I, I put together from this paper, all these things can influence how flammable stuff is, how likely it is to burn in the, in the pre-ignition phase. Um, so uh, we don't need to go in them, just you need to note that there's lots of different aspects of the plant. There's the physical structure of the plant that can make it more likely to burn or less likely to burn. There's the chemical composition of the plant and there's where that material is in the canopy or, or have fallen um, onto the ground. <clears throat> in terms of where we are in California, the main things that were the, the main categories that we talk about are um, from a management standpoint. So we talk about grasses or grasses and forbs, chaparral uh, typically or sh you know, shrublands, these sort of oily Mediterranean shrublands type stuff, or trees, right? So when we talk about other areas of the country, people will, will really emphasize forest fires. So they'll really emphasize the tree component here. And we absolutely, of course, have trees here, but we are, um, at least here in Southern California, we're much more likely to have grasses or this, these shrubland um, as, as key fuels where the fire will start and where the fire will primarily be fed um, and grow. Uh, the key um, weather factors, um, we'll talk about winds, but, the, but wind is obviously important, but the things, the other aspects are gonna be um, heat, so we tend to have more fires in the, in the hotter times of the year. We tend to have more fires in the drier times of the years. We're not seeing rain, and those tend to correlate. Um, and then in years of particular drought. And so one of my big irks that has irked me forever about um, uh, in about mm, two months, we'll see this. We'll start, we're going to be sort of leaving, being in mid-spring towards the end of spring, and all the fire departments start coming out going, this is going to be the worst fire year ever. It doesn't matter if it rained a lot. If it rained a lot, they go, oh my God, there's all this fuel as grass has grown up. And if it hasn't rained, like, oh my God, we've gotten no rain. So this stuff is super dry. And I don't find that particularly helpful because once you scream, once you cry wolf a lot of times, people just start to tune out and go, yeah, okay, fire season, whatever. But it is true that we have, even though the public safety folks say, oh, it's a wet year, so it's really bad for, for rain, on average, it's really bad when we don't have rain, right? So droughts are really the weather condition that drive, uh, that make this disaster type more likely. And then dry lightning. So in particular, that is a phenomenon that we have, um, it can be anywhere on the planet, but in particular here in the Southwest, it's where we have these um, late afternoon thunderstorms typically in our part of the world. And so uh, atmospheric conditions generate these, these high altitude clouds and they're going around and, and they can uh, have rain, or excuse me, they can have lightning and spark lighting, typically this would be in the like 1 to 2 to 3 p.m. time frame, so sort of late in the day. Um, but there's usually very little rain. 
So it's not as if it's, it's a thunder, like classic thunderstorm where there's like, you know, the murder mystery where there's like rain pelting against the window and lightning lights up the background as the murderer has the, 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 the knife or whatever. It's not that kind of rain. It's, it's rather really, really high up rain that's so hot it, and, and the, the area is so warm and hot in the summer that the rain never gets to the ground, but the lightning does. And so you get the lightning uh, spark without the potential mitigating force of the water squelching whatever happens. So dry lightning is also a key driver of this. And in fact, this is one of the, this is right now as we're leaving, we've just had this big atmospheric river that just came through. At, on the tail end of this is maybe conditions for dry lightning. Now we've had so much water, we're probably not gonna have any, many fires, but, but um, dry lightning might be possible in the next few days. Um, okay, and then uh, topography matters. And so um, these, as we mentioned before, but uh, as we'll see again, um, the wind-driven fires. So the, the most important factor once a, a fire gets going is the wind. And what predicts whether we're gonna have a, a small fire or call it a few engines or, or, or you know, geographically restricted, or is it a big giant conflagration that's gonna go and burn houses and cost millions and billions of dollars and that kind of stuff, is the wind. And so um, in most cases, for our part of the world, it's offshore winds and, and catabatic winds are the same thing. Catabatic winds are, are um, uh, uh, winds driven by the geography. And so <clears throat> you can get catabatic winds wherever, in our part of the world, uh, these, are the, these, are very, these are essentially the same thing, or very similar. So what we're talking about is um, uh, warm air from in our interior area, so in our case it's like the Mojave and places like that, um, that uh, get essentially funneled through our coastal canyons to the ocean. And, um, and so we call those Santa Ana winds. If you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, they'll call those Diablo winds. Um, and different areas of the world have different terms for them, but that phenomenon is what is, is, is a key factor there in terms of um, wildfire. In terms of what fires do ecologically, uh, the first thing they do once we, once we have this, once the wildfire initiates, is the air quality goes down, right? It's smoky, it's hard to breathe, there's, there's particulate matter in the air. Um, they're gonna then burn up the biomass. So if they're a forest, the, maybe the trees burn up and they, they, the amount of biomass goes away. As we, uh, the hydrophobicity, as we talked about, the, the baking, essentially it's like, like we made a clay pot with this heat on the soil and we tend to, to change the surface chemistry of the soil. Depends on how hot it is as, as to how thick that is. Is that like a millimeter or is that like half a centimeter or whatever, but, but in, in any event, we increase the hydrophobicity. So we increase the, the difficulty of water being able to penetrate to that soil. And um, from our observations after several years of many fires, um, we see uh, the small mammal population in particular gets whacked in terms of the mobile critters. They bear the brunt of the burden. So the voles, the squirrels, uh, the rabbits, those kind of things, um, their, their populations will be reduced. The larger critters usually can run away, at least if it's a moderately scaled fire. Okay, next, so, after, so that, that's the first thing. The primary impact is that, boom. Secondary impact, and so now the fire's been put out or, or you know, a couple weeks or months later, whatever, we're gonna have much higher likelihood of erosion and flooding. One, because there's, first and foremost, there's that vegetation, the, the, the physical rugosity, that roughness of the surface of the hillsides or whatever is no more. It's now flat, it's now very smooth. So it's much easier for when it does rain, that water to get going faster and faster and faster. Nothing is slowing it down. Secondarily, because of that uh, hydrophobicity, because of that, that lack of water being able to percolate into the soil easily, that water is hitting the surface and then staying on the surface. So both those things tend to promote flooding and erosion. Uh, and then we also will see also flooding because some of that in, in, a, in a riparian context, in a river context, because those trees, um, the, 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 say the trees that did survive, that then get sort of ripped down and get stuck in the river, those things uh, tend to create um, dams, which are a problem uh, when they just sort of pop up on their own. And that will tend to increase flooding in and around the riparian corridor, allow water to build up. And so the houses will flood or the roads will flood. Um, and then we're gonna get an increase in um, uh, uh, the types of plants 
that can survive fires. So the susceptible vegetation will be burnt and will tend to have the hardier fire tolerant, fire loving, or even fire needing vegetation that will become relatively more dominant. And then after many months to years afterwards, the, the, the tertiary impact is succession. So this fire will act like a new disturbance thing and reset the playing field, right? So, it's, so we can imagine a, a very um, you know, tall, tall shrubland, let's say, around us with all these, you know, you can't see much ground. And so you have a few shrubs, let's say, or a few species of shrubs that are really physically dominating and, and most of the, the canopy is, is that. Now the fire comes through, erases all that, and so now there's a chance for windblown seeds, for bird dispersed seeds, things like that to come in. And so we see as the, the sort of resetting of the successional uh, a chain of events. Um, and in general, we see an increase in overall vegetation landscape heterogeneity. So it tends to, so moderate fire, uh, historic fire tends to increase the overall, um, let's say plant, the overall plant diversity in a site. The worry with climate change in our management is that we're bringing fire too frequently. And so, so that's not necessarily the case as we move into the future, but historically, moderate fire allowed more diversity. Cool, make sense? Questions? Oh, oh yeah, sorry, John. Like so, so the question is, what about, so I mentioned that small mammals tank, what about other things? And so um, we can use, for example, the Woolsey fire or for example, the Springs fire that happened here on campus uh, in 2013. Um, uh, uh, many, many dead small critters. So just about all those guys died. So some of them like were physically burnt. Other individuals, um, other individuals were um, uh, uh, inhaled too much smoke, right? So essentially like suffocated, if you will. Or, or the heat was such that it, it caught, like rabbits are notoriously, like you look at a rabbit and you go, hey, and the rabbit dies. Like the rabbit's like, ah, like they're, oh, and they have a heart attack. So, um, so it's either the stress of the fire or, or other effects. Um, it's not necessarily just getting burned up. But in general, what's going on to answer uh, that question is small mammals, when there's a problem, they generally are like, oh my God, go in my burrow. Or, oh my God, stop moving, right? Like get small and like freeze, right? And so if you're a mountain lion, that's probably a good thing to do. Or a hawk, that's probably a good thing to do, right? But if you're a giant wall of flame, that's probably not very good, right? So, they, so that's why they get tanked. The medium bodied, meaning like say, bobcats and, and larger deer and things like that, coyotes and stuff, those guys tend to go like, what? I'm out of here. And they tend to run um, from, from the disturbance, in this case, the fire. And so in the case of the Springs fire, we had a crap load of deer, a crap load of bobcats, tons and tons of coyotes out in the strawberry fields. So they all ran from, you know, on campus here, they all ran away from the flames and they just went right out into the areas. Adults. The, the, larger, the large body mammals that we saw that died were the babies, were the little bambies, right? So because those bambies, just like the small mammals, their adaptive response to stress is freeze, right? So, so like, you know, so they sit there and they're, they're laying down, like maybe we're just born, they're kind of chilling out. And in response to stress, they don't move. So just like the small mammals, that's great if it's a active, you know, carnivore searching to eat them and, and they're, they're, they're better able to avoid them by not moving. But again, that, that fire front is more likely to kill them. So, so in general, of course, there's fewer, you know, some coyotes got burned or whatever, but, but then what the day after that, that fire, um, we saw in Camp Park tons of, like, like all those deer and, and larger bodied mammals, for example, came back into Camp Park. So they were, so they were back. So, so um, uh, if it's a fire that's going from here all the way to the ocean, let's say, then they're probably going to get whacked too. But in most cases, these larger critters can, can choose to move, and they do move out of the path of the fire, or at least try to. The small guys don't. Does that answer your question? No? Okay. Okay. Um, and so, again, it's important to say that, that the types of communities that surround campus here, here in, in coastal Southern California, Many of these Mediterranean ecosystems not only have adapted to handle fire, but actually need fire to, to complete the life history or life cycle of, of several different species. 
And so, um, you know, some of these some of these critters, it's super amazing. So, so we have some of our seeds in the seed bank here uh, can be in the soil for a hundred years, and incredibly hard, like very very. Some of these ceanothus and some of these some of these um, you know sh shrub species, uh, really really, you know, solid seed coat. Like if you and I try to get into it, like we'd have a knife and we'd have a hard time cutting into it. Kind of you know very very re responsive. And so um, for some of these species, uh, they have to be smoked, meaning, meaning when people were trying to figure out way back when how to germinate the seeds, it was like, I don't know, I can't make, like put the seed in water, which you'd normally put a seed in water, right, and it would germinate. It ain't, nothing happened. It's like, what's going on? I don't know, let me try this, I don't know, let me try And it wasn't until we put it near smoke first and the chemistry of that smoke interacted with the outer coating of the seed to change it uh, chemically, that then when we take that seed and then put that seed in the water, the water can penetrate through the outer seed coat and then start start to swell the tissues and essentially crack open the seed and the cotyledons come out and the plant starts to germinate. And in fact, some of these species, it can't just be any old smoke. If you and I got like some oak wood and went to our backyard, you know, fire pit and, and, and put the seeds in, that wouldn't work. It has to be, um, uh, species from that ecosystem burning. And so some of the volatile organic compounds are some of the key triggers. So they're not all that way, but, but the point is um, uh, some of these systems and some of these species really need fire to, to, to propagate and do stuff like that. In general, here in California, our fire prone landscapes would be grasslands. So we only have grasslands where there, is a, where there either isn't enough water to support woody vegetation or where the disturbance, and the most common disturbance is fire, or where the fire is so frequent, it burns up all the woody things. So grasslands are a classic uh, uh, a fire prone landscape. Um, chaparral, coastal woodlands, mixed conifer forests, all these have fire to one degree or another. Um, and again, don't write this down, so, but this is just for visual, um, so you guys can sort of get, get the sense here. Um, there's a lot of uh, complexity that goes into here. And moisture has um, a lot of impacts and it depends how, how the way moisture will play out is going to depend on what ecosystem we're talking about. And, and again, don't write this down, but just suffice it to say, depending on the ecosystem and depending on the factor, a little teeny small change can make a massive difference in that community's propensity to burn. So like many things with, with these environmental change discussions, we talk about, oh, you know, we're worried about you know, 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, you know, uh, average global temperature change. And some people that are not used to working in nature or whatever, like 1.5, that doesn't sound too much. Like if I'm cold, I want to turn up the degree, you know, my air conditioner, 10 degrees. It's like, what's a small difference? As these graphs show, a very small difference in any of these environmental variables can lead to a much uh, uh, greatly increased probability of burning. So it's not, it's not a linear process and it's very complex. There's people who spend their whole careers trying to figure this out. The point is um, there's a lot of things uh, interplaying together with one another here. Okay, in general, what we've done, one of the things that we've done with, with our management and our choices, our active choices as a society is we've chosen to add a lot more fuel to um, our California environment. And we've done that starting in the 1800s. So we humans have evolved with fire. We've used fire. We use fire to cook. We use fire to do all this kind of stuff. We use fire to herd animals, all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, indigenous people in North America, indigenous people here in California use fire actively, right? They use fire actively to manage fire risk, but also to make life easier for them. So um, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that we burned was, for example, in, in, in places like the Central Valley and other places was to promote acorns, right? So uh, uh, in some parts of California, 
the meal that you'd make from uh, the starch that you get from acorns was a key was a key food stuff. So they'd take that that stuff, they'd blanch it. If you try to eat it, it's bad, but they'd, they'd blanch it with boiling water and take some of the toxins out, and then they would pound it up and turn it into a paste, essentially. And that, that was a, a key staple or a key part of their diet. Now, you and I could walk around all day and pick acorns, right? Which, okay, we could do that. Or you go, that sucks. What if we just go to one big honking tree and just get all the acorns in like 20 minutes as opposed to like two hours of walking around. Like that sounds like makes sense. So in some cases, fire was used in that manner to burn up all the little bitty baby uh, trees and other, other shrubs and things that might compete with these trees so that we'd have these big honking, you know, mother trees. In other cases, it would be to promote other species that we'd want in a certain area or not. Um, so there's all types of reasons and there was very sophisticated use of fire as a technology. Um, by uh, our, our first peoples that, that lived here. Um, and before 1800 versus the bulk of, of the 1900s, um, fire was much more ubiquitous. There were lots of more fires. In fact, when, when um, uh, the first European folks came into what we now call Los Angeles, they had a hard time seeing it because it was all fog. They called, thought it was foggy. It was actually the smoke from all the small fires that were burning in the, in the LA basin, right? Not from cars, but from the vegetation. Um, okay, so, um, what's ha so even though we had more fires in um, uh, the 1800s numerically than now, they were m at a much different scale, much different scale. So when the Europeans came in, we brought this unfortunate school of thought that primarily came from the Germans uh, in places like the Black Forest. So Germany has a lot of forests, and they don't like for fire in those forests, right? Because they're like, oh, it hurts the trees, whatever. So w when they came here, um, so uh, I went to, so my undergrad was at UCSB, and my program was the environmental, one of my majors was environmental studies. That was the second oldest environmental studies program in the nation. The oldest is at the Yale School of Forestry. And that Yale School of Forestry was started under this German model. And so this idea was fire is evil, fire is bad. And so Yale was a very powerful university and it was, you know, a good old boy network. And so a lot of the professional sort of government leaders and folks of that nature went through that program or, or knew of that program and respected that program. And so that really became the mantra. So our philosophy was not developed here in California. It was foisted on us in California from other regions and other settings. And so Europeans did not see fire as a management tool. They saw fire as an enemy. And so when we <clears throat> did all the stuff that we, all the horrible stuff that we did um, to indigenous peoples, and we removed them, in addition to just removing them and genocide and all that stuff, we also removed their, their methodology, their management approach. And so along with that, Generally speaking, the native peoples burn stuff, and it was like, oh, we got to stop that. Let's stop burning. In addition, by the 1800s, we've begun introducing other vegetation here in California, primarily from Europe, a little bit from Asia, but, but things that weren't native. And the most obvious one here is our annual grass community, which mostly, most of what we see now, we drive on a hillside in California, the Golden Hills, most of those species were not here 150 years ago. So we introduce all these uh, often annual grasses and we introduce livestock. And so the, the grasses um, uh, are thought, so when we bring these, these cattle, let's say over from, from Europe, like what do the cattle eat? Well, we better bring the food they eat, right? So that these things come together as a package. Um, okay, so uh, before um, 1800, w these are estimates, somewhere on the order of about 4 to 10-ish, my estimates here are 4.4 to 11.2 million acres per year were burned, and that was both natural lightning started fires as well as, as human active ignition, N native peoples burning the grasslands, burning the woodlands, that kind of stuff. Um, now we rarely get over a million acres per year, at least, well, let's just say like before 2010, uh, you know, something like that. Now we're kind of starting to push up into these numbers again, but, but not in a good way. So in other words, orders of magnitude different amounts of burning 
as what used to happen versus now. The difference is that stuff was very controlled. That stuff rarely got into large scale. It was, it was instead of you know, a few large, it was many, 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 many small burns. Um, yeah, and so now essentially burning has been heavily, in the last hundred years, has been heavily reduced except for in some of our dry mixed conifer forests, those things, because those are mostly lightning started fires, those fires still pretty much were, were, were going, but, um, but all the other ones, the grasslands, the shrublands, we actively started putting those out. And so this starts, as I mentioned, in the early 1900s. And this, the main, uh, the main factor here is the U.S. Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot. Um, and so uh, if you guys have taken environmental history, you'll, you'll know of the <clears throat> philosophical battle between sort of the John Muir uh, uh, preservationist sort of arm of the burgeoning conservation movement versus the Gifford Pinchot, which was the utilitarian approach. So, um, so Pinchot becomes the head, uh, the, the, the first head of the U.S. Forest Service. And so we, that's his view of forests are valuable. Not necessarily because forests are valuable in their own. Not necessarily because forests are valuable for the birds. But forests are valuable because we can chop down those trees and turn them into chairs. We can chop down those trees and turn them into buildings. So therefore, if a fire comes in and burns up that potential chair material, that potential house material, then we're, that's bad, right? Because then we don't have houses and stuff. So that really, so in the early 1900s, we have this new shift in thinking. And so fire now is not just a, not just sort of a dangerous to, you know, hurting you or your family, but fire is a, an economic threat. It's a threat to forestry. It's a threat to the grazing industry, at least as, as the narrative goes. In Northern California at this time, and so this is happening across the nation. Here's, in, in our California context, Northern California, um, is doing um, a lot of fire suppression because there they're worried about their timberlands, their, their forest. In Southern California, um, the suppression here is directed primarily at um, uh, grasslands and rangelands and stuff like that. So we don't have the same kinds of forests that they do up north. Um, ironically, um, with the, as we burn these, um, these shrublands, they're replaced by grasslands, which actually are more, more flammable. So, so more on that in a bit. Um, okay, then we have, this is not here in California, but it has impacts for the whole country. So this is, this is back in, in um, Idaho, Montana, but we have the Great Fire of 1910, massive fire. So in and of itself, it would be in the, in the record books of you know, just the scales, huge fire. But, but um, the main thing that we worry about or the main reason everybody talks about this, this has a massive impact on our approach to fighting wildfire. Um, not just wildfire, but wildfire. And so what happens there is, is the, the forces, the, the new forest service people and rangers and, and, and professionals out there are massively overwhelmed. And not only is it, is it dangerous, it's a three million, an, and by the time it goes out, it goes for a long time, by the time it's out, it burns three million acres. So even, even today, that would be massive in scale. But back in the day when they didn't really have firefighting airplanes, didn't have satellites, it was, it was crazy. And things happened such as uh, groups of firefighters would be burned up and whole towns would get wiped away. And it was, it was, it was, it was as if we had no control. And at this time of our growing country of more and more power, the rising America, it was like, what? Nature's gonna tell us what to do? No way, we're gonna tell nature what to do. So this, this massive disaster, loss of life, you know, all this kind of stuff, drives a major rethinking of our approach to wildfire. In particular, it sets up the structure that we now have all over the place, even in urban, even in urban firefighting which is this paramilitary organization of fire departments, right? So up to this point, it was volunteer fire departments and, you know, do what you can. Now it's like professional equipment, professional training. One of, one of the most important tools all wildland firefighters will have is an, is a, an axe, a sort of pickaxe thing called a Pulaski. One of the guys that becomes a hero from the 1910, his name is Pulaski. He invents that. So, so we, we literally live with the, with the tools that were created in the wake of this 1910 fire still to this day. It also really has this massive change at the administrative level and says any fire now 
we will snuff out. We do not want fires to get big. So we're gonna actively try to put out as many fires as possible everywhere across the landscape. Um, and it starts this, this current thing of firefighters are heroes, they're like a big man, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna run, in, run into danger when everybody else is running away. That narrative all begins in the wake of 1910. Um, and then we really get, get super, super sophisticated in terms of our wildfire management in the wake of World War II. As with many things, fisheries, all kinds of stuff, a lot of the technology that we developed for war, now war is over, now we have all these new tools. Let's, what do we do with them? Hey, we can use them for X. And one of the X's is firefighting. And so, um, so in this era, in, in this early 1900 era, it's like, Fire is danger to our economy. We better, better do something about it, right? Whereas now it becomes every single life we should be protecting. Every parcel of every outhouse, every ranch house, every whatever, we should be worried about that. That's, that, that, that's the, the motivator. So we enter this very, very aggressive suppression uh, era where we're actively trying to put out all fire. And um, it doesn't matter how much it costs, right? Put the fire out. We'll deal with the fire later. And since that, since World War II, the, the cost for fighting fires every year has gone up and 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 up. Because we're like, well, no, we need now we need more helicopters. Now we need more airplanes. Now we need more, you know, fill in the blank. And and as a consequence, the technologies that are being deployed are ever, ever more sophisticated. So for example, this is a, a shot from 1955. And this is sort of all this, this is this is considered like awesome. This is a, like a glory shot. Like, look at, we're bringing all of these essentially weapons of war and technology of war now to bear against nature. So we have helicopters flying around. We have, um, we have uh, bulldozers we have that are very powerful, very po much more powerful engines than the kind of engines we had before. We have fire trucks that have the ability to pump their own water. Um, again, with the powerful diesel innovation and, and stuff like that. We have Jeeps that we're using war that now can drive over, you know, multiple, you know, all-terrain all vehicles kind of stuff, all that jazz. So this becomes our new approach. And unfortunately, that was not a good thing in the long run. So uh, that also leads to this proliferation of these forestry schools that say, that, that promote the same old German philosophy of all fire, bad, all the time. Right? And the so-called suppression at all costs, we get the so-called 10 a.m. rule, which is we want to nuke the fires before 10 a.m. We want to see where they are. And so that leads to this whole network of, like you might see these old cartoons where these folks have these um, you know, wildfire spotting stations and people are out in the forest on these like lookouts and they're looking around. And that's all because we're trying to find the fire early and get to it early. Um, and so unfortunately, nature is the thing um, that loses here. So um, it, it is in this era, it's the government and people like me, it's professor types that tell the local landowners how they should be doing. Like you don't understand, you're just so ignorant, right? So it's the local folks that might have a farm, that might have a ranch, that might have lived with fire for some time. So not the same knowledge base as the native peoples, but nevertheless, they, they live there and they understand, hey, if we have all these fuels building up, that's probably not a good thing. But it's, it's like, you know, like people like me would walk in and go, oh, you silly, you don't understand. I'm from CSUCI, let me explain to you how it works. Right, so that was very much the dominant, um, the dominant sort of power structure and stuff. Um, we almost, we almost uh, fought this in California, but it didn't work. And so, um, so uh, as this policy was being brought to California, some of the fires, particularly uh, uh, landowners, particularly in Northern California, that had lived in close um, association with the native peoples, the tribes that were still around there, um, learned from the tribes, like, oh, we should do some of this burning. We should do some of this, you know, you know prophylactic burning and kind of take some of these, these um, uh, burnable vegetation out so that we don't have a bigger fire later. They actually fought when, when this policy was coming to us. Unfortunately, they lost, but, but they, were, they tried very hard. They said, no, 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 this, if we go down this route, this is gonna be a recipe for badness over time. Um, 
Yeah. And so as I mentioned before, as I talked about this already, but like Pinchot, Gibbard Pinchot versus John Muir and the utilitarian versus sort of the eco ecological functioning. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, also this ever growing um, uh, cost to do this stuff. Okay, so up to this point, there's, there's um, uh, some buy-in, but again, like in Northern California places that people actually know what's going on, they're like, yeah, no, man, this isn't working. Um, and so in comes the American uh, uh, advertising, Madison Avenue, right? The American, um, uh, uh, let me convince you of what you really want to be doing industry. So they were really big and they were, they've always been big in our country. Um, they lost a massive amount of credit in the wake of the 1928 stock market crash in the Great Depression. Because they were like saying, buy stocks, buy, hey you common folks, put your money in the stock market. And the stock market imploded. So then there was a, they had this really, really bad eye, black eye. And everybody was like, don't trust the, the advertising executives. They're, they're, they're evil, they're trying to convince you of something that's not good for you. Okay, jump forward to World War II. And um, uh, one of the, uh, there's only a couple places on the US mainland where um, there's actual activity, you know, wartime activity. One of those is on, or some of those are on the West Coast because we're close to Japan, because we are pumping out so much oil and gas, so, so much petroleum from places like San Luis Obispo, Avila Beach. If you guys come with me on my coastal trip, you guys will see that and, and things of that nature. And in places like Santa Barbara and Ventura and all that kind of stuff. So, so um, famously on February 23rd, 1942, um, you know, very early on in World War II, this, this is essentially a, a terrorism campaign. This is a psychological ops. So a submarine comes over, a Japanese submarine comes over, and the idea was we're gonna try to spook the Americans. So it's one ship, they're not gonna, you know, they weren't gonna attack, you know, invade California or anything, but the idea is to try to create fear and make people, th make Americans think they're more vulnerable than they are. So basically they, they shoot some, they, they, they shoot off some shells at a terminal there at Elwood, right, near, near, near modern day UCSB, near where the, um, the butterfly uh, uh, sanctuary is now. Shoot it off and mostly nothing happens. So this is a picture of what happens. So they, they hit, they hit a, a you know, couple things and blow up an, an outhouse and so, you know, kind of knock some stuff up. But, but nothing, nothing really happens. But of course, it's massive news, right? So it's in all the national newspapers. Oh my God, we're, we're being attacked, we're being bombed. And so that starts, yeah, Chris. Do we know this is a Japanese submarine? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a, there a um, I, I can actually post it, I guess. There's a great um, uh, lecture that a historian did a, a year or so ago about sort of the history of it. So it's, it's pretty interesting, but. Um, but uh, it turns out a lot, a lot of those, either the, the, the captains of the submarine or the first officers were actually, had been to all these places before because they were like, you know, doing exports. And so they, they were tasked with, hey, go back and like, you know where the stuff is, right? But again, this is before radars, before GPS, and it's like a foggy coast, so it's hard to find the exact spot. Anyway, um, so yeah, so this stuff, so, so essentially shells come from the ocean and, and strike uh, land, nothing big happens. But this starts the West Coast invasion scare, right? So this starts all this horrible stuff and this massive fear. So I, I, um, we're gonna run out of time here. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll just finish this up and then we'll pick this up next time, I guess. So, um, so when I was your age, one of my first uh, environmental jobs was I, was I was canvassing for an environmental organization that, that um, essentially I was, I was the guy that would go around and try to get people to give us money, like, Awesome job, not, right? It, it, was, it was a great learning job, I learned a lot, but it was a horrible job. Anyways, one day I knocked on this guy's door. Uh, this is in uh, the southern part of the San Francisco Bay Area. And the guy opened the door, like, what do you want? I'm like, hey man, you know, da 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 da, you wanna help the planet and everything? And he went off in this whole thing and he told me, he was like this old cranky conservative dude, and he was like, well, you know, I don't have your time. Yet. And he tells me this story about how the Japanese were going to invade Long Beach, and they'd convinced, oh, because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of racist stuff, right, obviously. And so a lot of the um, gardening community back in the day were, were Japanese. Like, oh, the, the, all these gardens, they planted these flowers in the shapes of, shapes of arrows and everything. So that the bombers, when they'd come in from Japan, they would see where to bomb. You know, it's all, it's all made up, right? 
But, but he believed that because of this massive fear, this massive you know, misinformation campaign, this massive you know, freak out campaign, and that all begins with the, with the bombing of, of these oil uh, terminals. Um, and so that also, amongst other things, that leads to the Japanese internment, right? We don't intern the, the, the Germans, we don't intern the Italians, right? But we intern the Japanese, right? So all that is, is so everybody's freaked out. Like, oh my God, got to go through blackout drills and, and any day now we're going to be destroyed, right? And so in that mix, the U.S. Forest Service sees an opportunity. And so they go, oh my God, if these shells hadn't hit the pier or right next to the pier, what if they'd gone farther over? What if they were like, really, really strong shells, and they went to the Los Padres forest, and they blew up and they started a forest fire. Oh my God, forest fires are horrible. So therefore, not only are forest fires bad for the reasons they thought beforehand, but oh my God, well, now we can play into this fear. We can play into this uh, fear of the other and all that kind of stuff. So, so wildfires get sucked into this, you know, jingoistic thing. And so, uh, so the forest fire, the, 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 the Advocates for fighting fires go, how we can do this? Let's get the advertising industry involved. And the advertising industry was desperate because everybody hated them. Like, oh, we'll do it for free. Yeah, 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 we'll do it. Yeah, we'll help. We'll help the war effort, right? And so the National Association of State Foresters gets together with the War Advertising Council of all people, right? And um, starts to create a series of, of ads, of, of propaganda, right? That say, forest fires aid the enemy, right? and all this racist stuff and all this, all this jazz, and that our carelessness is their secret weapon, right? They're, they're trying to take us out with our forest fires, right? All that kind of stuff. And so initially adults are targeted, but then they realize pretty quickly that, you know, we should, have, we should get everybody involved in here. And it's like, we want some kids. How can we get some kids involved? And so um, Bambi at the time, so, so Walt Disney had just made the film Bambi. And if you've seen Bambi, right, there's a, there's a, there's an evil, you know, fire is sort of evil in that film. Bambi's not doing too well. It's not, not much of a box office success. So they partner with Bambi. Say, hey, can we use images of Bambi in some of our propaganda? And then it starts getting all around. People are like, oh, maybe I should go see this movie. And so we go from um, uh, Bambi to eventually Smokey the Bear. So this is from Bambi, right? So, like, like, so, the, so the, the campers aren't paying attention. Their campfire gets out of hand and starts this big conflagration, right? And that's a big evil thing. And so, and so the idea was like, yeah, we can totally use this, right? And so the very first uh, anti-wildfire uh, campaigns have Bambi in them, right? And then Bambi's saying, please, mister, don't be careless, right? Or whatever the hell, I don't know how Bambi talks, but whatever he talks, right? And poor Thumper's there, and Flower's there, and they're all afraid, right? The, the, the poor critters, the poor nice, warm fuzzies. Yeah? Was Bambi only, like, the only uh, popular uh, actor? Yeah, yeah. In terms of the box office, I mean, some people went, but, but as far as, like, the big, like, cultural phenomenon that it became, it was after, the, after this massive wildfire advertising campaign. Um, and so, so the first thing is, hey, let's talk about that. And then, and then the, it, it evolves into some, some images of fire. And, and this only lasts for a little while. And after after, um, after uh, Bambi starts taking off, then Walt Disney's like, that's cool. We're gonna, we don't need to be involved with this anymore. We're going to do our own thing. And so then, so then the rhetoric switches to be more about nature and then eventually about fear, right? Straight up fear. So this is sort of cute, warm fuzzies. This is sort of nature in general kind of thing. And then this is, is, is straight up, um, you know, be afraid, be very afraid kind of thing. And then, and then we have, and we're just about out of time, so maybe we'll start, stop, um, let's see, we'll stop here or, yeah, yeah, so we'll, we'll stop these next two slides. So then we have a Smokey the Bear. And in Smokey the Bear, we still live with Smokey the Bear right now, right? So Smokey the Bear comes along and Smokey uh, starts in 1944. And uh, you know the story is there's this bear. He's so 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 sort of Smokey the Bear kind of gets going. Um, we have some rhetoric, um, and again, this is sort of this. And, and the next iteration is is more of this. Like you know that's good enough. Like it's cool. You don't need to put your hand on and make sure that it's out. And you know all that kind of stuff. And then um, we have. Um, uh, a bear, a little bear cub in New Mexico, uh, a wildfire comes through, burns up, kills, kills the mom, and the little bear cub is 
up in the tree and survives. Singed, but survives. So, you know, gets taken down, becomes this huge, um, and uh, this huge um, icon, goes to the U.S., uh, um, the National Zoo, excuse me, in Washington, D.C., and becomes super popular. He becomes so popular, he gets his own zip code. This one bear gets his own zip code, because every school kid from around the country starts writing, and they name him Smokey the Bear, because he was in the fire, right? And so he becomes this living icon example of the badness of fire, but also we want to stop the fire because we don't want to hurt well Smokey the Bear, right? That kind of thing. And that really, um, and we're essentially, we've been more or less stuck in that for many decades. And so, and so this is sort of a modern, a modern take on Smokey the Bear. And uh, that pretty much reigns true to this day. We've started seeing some changes in the 1970s, which we'll talk about uh, next time. Um, but basically, um, that, 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 all this rhetoric is incredibly powerful, right? Is incredibly powerful. And we start to train kids, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, kids, hey, you know, this is how you treat fire, right? You always have, fire's always bad, fire's always bad. And so it's never fire as a tool. It's never fire as a part of the ecosystem. It's always fire as in opposition to you and fire as in danger. And so that's why we spent a century allowing the fuels to increase, to increase, to increase. And this is a teaser before we wrap. I'll just show this. We'll, we'll start with this next time. But this is a, a historic uh, visualization of fire. And so we're going here from the 1600s to, to recent times. This is constructed from uh, dendrochronology, from, from tree ring, the study of tree rings. And so one of the neat things about uh, tree rings is they grow typically in annual rings. And in most dicots, not, not palm trees and stuff, but most, most of our trees um, uh, lay down these concentric growth rings. Fires will scar them. Fires will char them. Not necessarily kill the tree. And so when we go through, and we, we do a cross section of the tree or do a tree core, we can look at that and we can see you know, light, dark, light, dark, so you know, growth ring, growth, and then you'll see a charred one, a black charred, oh, okay, so there's a fire here, right? And then didn't kill it, so it kept growing. And then by taking down trees that haven't been burned up, but, but are down on the ground, but they're you know, been dead for 50 years or something, we can start to walk back. And with carbon dating and things, we can start to walk things back. So, so this is a reconstructed history. So we don't necessarily have a single tree that was alive in 1600 to now. But we have many, um, many trees that were able to construct this. And so um, just by way of, of showing us, we'll talk about this again, as I said, next time. But basically, we, so this is the percent of sites that have um, uh, fires occurring. And then this is the number of fire scars on the sites. And so the percent is this the percent is this, is this guy right here, right? So you can read the percent over here on this axis. And then this white jagged line is over here. This is the number of fires at, at particular sites. So, and in one particular site, it's not burning every single year, right? Kind of up and down. And then when we have massive fires, uh, those are labeled here with these numbers. But what we basically see is, and, and, and this data is from um, uh, Intermountain West, but but still, it, it, it's the general pattern. So check it out, right? 1600, fire and a fire, 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 whoop, boom. So this is the effect of all of those Smokey the Bear. This is the effect of all those, uh, the fire is the enemy. We, we massively reduce the, the background level of fires um, by our not allowing lots of small, small or, or more numerous small scale fires. Cool? Okay, so I'm gonna pause there. Any questions about that stuff so far?